Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the Google Pixel 6a. This is the entry level version of Google's Pixel phone that shares some of the guts and some of the features of their more expensive smartphones. And you might find this to be a pretty nice value. We're going to be taking a closer look at this phone and what it's all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from Google. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. Let's get into it now and see what this phone is all about. Now, the price point on this is $449 at the time I'm recording this video. That's about $150 less than the regular Pixel 6 phone. Now, over the course of my overview of the phone, I'll talk about what this phone doesn't have and the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro do have if you're trying to figure out whether or not to go with this one or spend a little bit more for their flagship phone. Now, this has a Google Tensor processor. This is the same Google design chip that's in the flagship phones. And in our testing, you'll see that it actually performs the same as those higher end phones as well. So they did not throttle anything back on here. Now, as far as RAM is concerned, this has six gigabytes of RAM on board versus eight gigabytes on the more expensive phones. That means if you're doing a lot of multitasking, you might find your apps having to reload completely versus just running in the background. I didn't notice that all too much in my use of the phone, but if you are an enthusiast, I think that extra two gigabytes of RAM will make a little bit of a difference. This has 128 gigabytes of storage on board. There is no SD card upgrade option. Now the base level Pixel 6 and 6 Pro also have 128 gigabytes on board with no SD card option, but they also have a more expensive version that has 256 gigabytes of onboard storage. So if you're loading up a lot of apps or movies, the other phones might do a little better there because they do have more storage available if you're willing to pay more. Now this phone is available in three different colors. We have the one that they call chalk. There is also a green looking one. I believe that one is called sage. And there's also a black color called charcoal. The color you select is just going to determine what the back of the phone looks like. So this one is the chalk color. And as you can see, we've got a nice white backing here along with an off-white panel above the camera bar. It feels very nice, but it's not as nice as the 6 and 6 Pro are because the 6 and 6 Pro have a glass back and this is a plastic. It's got a name that, that Google gave it, but it's still plastic nonetheless. So it doesn't feel as heavy as those other phones do. And it has a little bit more weight towards the top than the middle and bottom. So it almost feels a little top heavy versus the other phones, which are more balanced. It also doesn't support wireless charging, which the 6 and 6 Pro do allow for through their glass backing. So just keep that in mind. A little uh, reduction there to save some cost, I think. The side, though, is aluminum. The front is Gorilla Glass, so it's got a pretty good feel, but it doesn't feel, again, as nice as the more expensive phones. The camera system is a little different on this, too. So this has the ultra-wide lens that's on the 6 and 6 Pro with the same sensor. It's a 12 uh, megapixel ultra wide lens running at a 2.2 aperture. This one has a lower resolution wide angle lens, which is running at 12.2 megapixels versus 50 megapixels on the 6 and 6 Pro. So the more expensive phones get a significantly higher resolution camera. But as you'll see in a little bit, Google does so much computational photography these days that the difference is not enormous. And the image quality out of here is quite nice, although uh, the other phones do have a much higher starting resolution, which I think will uh, result in better photos. But for the price here, I think this one is just fine. Uh, this does not have a telephoto lens, but the 6 Pro does. Now it has a nice 6.1 inch OLED display on the front. This is running at the same resolution as the Pixel 6 phone, which is 1080 by 2400. But because this screen is slightly smaller, you actually have more pixel density on this Pixel phone versus the more expensive Pixel 6. But the Pixel 6 Pro does have a higher resolution display uh, versus this one and the regular 6. This doesn't have some of the features you'll find on the more expensive Pixel phones where the screen wraps around the casing. It's pretty much a flat display, but it looks very nice. The camera is at the top there, kind of punched out and they integrated the fingerprint reader into the display here. So you just hold down for about a second and that'll let you into the phone. I programmed in a few of my other fingers here and you can see it lets me in pretty quickly. 
but you can't just tap it once to get in. You gotta hold it there for a second. So you hold it down and you are in. Now there's been some discussion online about the refresh rate of the display on the Pixel 6a. This is running at 60 hertz, whereas the 6 runs at 90 and the 6 Pro can go up to 120. And what that means is that when you're scrolling through web pages here like I am, the scrolling is going to feel smoother on the 6 and 6 Pro to the point where those phones may feel like they're performing faster because things are snappier and that's because the screen can refresh itself at a faster rate. That makes a big difference for scrolling here obviously, but also for games that can run at frame rates higher than 60 frames per second. Those games will look smoother on the more expensive phones than they will on this one, even though all of three phones have the same processor on board. And if that's something that's important to you, then I think it's probably worth spending a little bit more to go up to the 6 and 6 Pro. But I think for most consumers, this is not going to be something you'll notice. And it's about on par with many of the smartphones you may have bought even at the flagship level about three or four years ago. So not bad, uh, I think, for a consumer looking for a nice phone. But I'm sure that there are enthusiasts out there who will want a phone with a faster refresh rate. And coming back to the front-facing camera here, this is an 8 megapixel camera. You can take portrait mode pictures with it, as you can see here. And it can also shoot 1080p video at 30 frames per second. This is the same front-facing camera that's on the regular Pixel 6 phone. The 6 Pro has a higher resolution camera that runs at 11 megapixels and can shoot 4K video at up to 30 frames per second. Now the phone is water and dust resistant. It's got an IP67 rating. The 6 and 6 Pro are IP68 rated, which means they might do a little bit better, but I would not submerge any of them in water without some kind of additional protection. But if you drop it in a puddle or something, it should do fine. Now the phone should work on all of the major carriers here in the United States. It is sold unlocked, so you can pop in your SIM card. You can also download an eSIM to the phone. And then if you pop in another carrier's card in the physical SIM slot, you can run on two different carriers. This supports 5G, both the sub-6 5G, but also the faster ultra-wideband 5G that many US carriers offer. So it'll work on both of those, just like the more expensive phones do. Now, beyond that SIM card slot, there's not much in the way of ports on this. The only other port you've got on the bottom here is the USB Type-C port for charging. This will also work with data devices. They give you an on-the-go adapter here if you want to try to plug in some regular USB devices to it. But it does not support video output, and it supports 18-watt charging, but not the faster 30-watt charging that you'll find on the more expensive phones. It has speakers at the bottom that sound very good for speaker phone calls and maybe some audio listening, but I think getting Bluetooth headphones attached might be the better route for audio quality. And I note Bluetooth headphones because there is no headphone jack on here. Uh, so you will need to use wireless headphones or attach a USB Type-C to headphone adapter here at the bottom. And you've got a volume rocker and a power switch here on the right-hand side of the device. Now, as far as battery life is concerned, Google says you can get about 24 hours or so of usage out of the phone before you have to charge it again. I'm not getting that good of battery life out of it, but I'm also farther away from my cell phone towers and I am doing things on the phone that stress its processor more, like taking a lot of pictures and video and playing games and that sort of thing, all the things I've been doing while testing. All that said, the battery life out of this is quite good, certainly all day, so you can get through the workday, pushing the phone pretty hard, I think, before you need to charge it up again. Now, one of the nice things about these Pixel phones is that Google updates them pretty frequently, and you often get exclusive features that come to other Android devices much later, and we'll look at one of those features in a few minutes. The performance here is very nice. As I mentioned, it's got the same Tensor chipset, as the 6 and 6 Pro do, and it performs at the same level. So I've got my YouTube channel running here. We'll just put it into uh, landscape mode there so you can see how quickly everything flips back and forth. And we'll go back to uh, the other mode here. And then what I can do is have that video continue running in the background here and load up uh, some web pages and scroll around the web while I uh, watch the video here. And everything seems pretty quick and responsive, even if the display isn't running at 90 or 120 hertz. From a performance standpoint, uh, this phone feels every bit as powerful as the more expensive devices. All right, let's focus in now on the camera system. And everything I shot on the camera system was in full auto mode. I didn't do anything fancy with it. 
And one of the things I wanted to point out here with the camera app is that it looks like you get three lenses here, even though you only have two on the back of the camera. So we have our ultra wide, we have our wide, and then we've got another option here that has a number two, which basically gives us a zoomed in image, but that is a digital zoom, which means that you're not going to get the same clarity that you would if you just had the one selected. So if you're able to get closer to your subject, walk a little bit closer as opposed to hitting that two, because that will cost you image quality. And even though the phone can do all sorts of computational magic, it's not gonna look as good as it would at the regular one setting. So just try to keep it on one as often as you can and only zoom if you really have to. Now the field of view on the ultra wide angle lens is 114 degrees. Now this photo is out of the regular wide lens and this is what the ultra wide can pick up from the same spot. So you do get a lot more in the scene there and you can do a lot of creative things when you get closer to subjects with that ultra wide lens. And the ultra wide lens can pick up some pretty good detail if you've got good outdoor light but the image quality that you'll get out of the wide angle lens will almost always be better. Uh, so this is the same flower shot on the same day. I did walk a little bit closer to it, but you can see we just have more detail in the flower here, a little less noise as we closed in on it. And that's partly because the wide angle lens is a 1.7 aperture, which is much wider than the uh, 2.2 aperture on the ultra wide lens. You also get a very nice natural bokeh or blurring effect of the background out of that wide angle lens. So I think if you're taking a picture of something with detail, using the wide angle lens is the way to go. And the camera does a pretty nice job of getting all that detail sorted out. And I'm not adjusting any of the images here. This is exactly what came out of the camera. Uh, here's another image that I shot on a sunny day. And you can see the detail here that the wide lens picked up. This is not the kind of picture you would get out of the ultra wide. So that looks very nice. Again, a very nice natural bokeh here. This is not portrait mode out of it. Here's a tree out in my yard, same situation, nice natural bokeh and plenty of detail here. And again, not a portrait mode photo. So if you can get really close to those subjects, get them focused and you will get a lot of what you can get out of portrait with a real uh, optical bokeh as opposed to an artificial digital one. Here's a shot I took today of my uh, camera here that I'm reviewing in another video getting rained on. And again, just lots of detail coming out of this 12 megapixel sensor. The Pixel 6 will look better than this, but I think this is a really nice quality image uh, for a phone at around this price point. And it does very well in lower light situations too. So this is my dining room that was very dark. I was getting a little bit of light from outside, but it was a gray overcast day. And I have a porch roof over where those windows are. So you don't get a lot of direct sunlight here. Uh, but as you can see, things look pretty good. You get some noise on the red uh, paint in the back here, but the object that is in uh, focus here has very little noise thanks to some of that computational work being done. And the detail here looks pretty good, I think. And this picture was shot in total darkness. This was using the night shot feature where you have to hold the camera really still and it does a longer exposure. Not a lot of detail, but it did pull out a lot more light than what I was seeing with my eyes. So you do get a lot of neat features that you would find on some of the more expensive phones in this one. But it does have a very nice portrait mode as most of these Google phones do. This is a shot of my youngest daughter shortly after she woke up. I can get away with that right now, but I'm sure not in the future. And as you can see here, her hair is all messy. And this is something that really challenges these portrait mode algorithms. But I think it did an okay job here. There are some areas that look a little off like this spot right here and maybe down over here, but I think overall it's a very nice looking picture, especially when you zoom out. It was a bit of a darker scene also. There was some light coming in from the porch door that was to her right there, um, but the left hand portion of her face was in a much darker area, and you can see it balanced things out quite nicely here. There is a reflection from her iPad uh, that she was playing with on the couch there, but nice portrait mode photo here in a very challenging environment, I think. And this one did really nicely. This is of my dog. This is Sasha. And look how nicely it got her cut out from the background here. Again, this is the portrait mode, uh, which it was able to algorithmically pull the dog out of here. And it's nice and sharp. I was really, really impressed with this. And there's a lot more to the camera system, which we could probably do an entire video about, but they have some Pixel 6a specific features right now 
which will be added to other phones in the near future. And I wanted to show you the one everyone's talking about, which is the Magic Eraser. So right here, we've got a photo of my dog out in the yard. I can click the Edit button here and go over to Tools and click on the Magic Eraser. And what it's going to do is look for suggestions of things that can be removed. And you can see it didn't get the dog here. But I'm going to zoom in a little bit here and just draw a circle around the dog. And what it will do is detect that that's what I was looking to get rid of. And it pretty cleanly gets the dog out of the image here. Uh, one thing I found, though, is that it's hard to navigate when you have the feature enabled because it keeps trying to remove more things here. But it does have to look at the adjacent pixels and kind of fill in what's missing. But it does as good a job, I think, as some software might do uh, on other apps. And it's built right into the Photos app here. And then you can, of course, put your dog back in if you want her there. It works great in this situation. There's some situations where it just doesn't have enough information to really fill it out properly, and you'll get a lot of mush. So you may want to play around with it a little bit. I also want to show you, though, the camouflage feature, which might work better in some instances. So in this example, I've got a dead group of flowers here that I want to get out of this picture. Now, if I circle them like we did with the dog, the AI just doesn't know what to do with it. It tries to kind of replicate the plants here, but it looks kind of weird. It looks like something happened over in that section because you have a lot of duplicated imagery. And that's what you'll see when things don't go right. So I'm going to undo that real quick. And instead, what I'm going to do is select camouflage. And I'm just going to circle around this area here. And as you can see, it turns all of these flowers into just green flowers. And that becomes less distracting against the rest of the image here. So that might be a good alternative to erasing something completely if you can just change its color and make it kind of blend in with the background there. And that was a neat little add-on to this feature that I wasn't expecting. Now, as far as video is concerned, out of the wide-angle lens, you can shoot 4K 60, but not out of the ultra-wide lens. So right now, I've got my camera mode here set to 4K at 60 frames per second. But you'll notice I just have the 1x and the 2 here for the uh, fake zoom, but I don't have the ultra wide. However, if I go to 30 frames per second, I now have the ultra wide lens available to me at the 4K resolution. The ultra wide will do 1080p at 60 frames per second, but not 4K. So just keep that in mind. If you don't see the ultra wide there, it's probably because you have it set to 4K 60. So let's start off with some ultra wide video here. This is 4K 30 out the back there. And you can see here it pans pretty smoothly thanks to all of the stabilization it has on board. This is an ultra wide shot that will transition in real time over to the wide angle lens as you can see there. A little bit jumpy when it makes that transition, but you can switch lenses while you're recording at 4K 30. And it has a nice optical and digital stabilization system built in. This is 4K 60 out the wide angle lens, and you can see even walking heavily, it does a pretty good job keeping a stable image. The image quality out of the wide angle lens at 4K 60 is pretty spectacular, I think. You get that natural bokeh along with some really nice detail at 4K, even at the highest frame rate here. You do have to struggle sometimes to keep the autofocus in the right spot, but it does do a nice job and provides a lot of detail when you've got everything dialed in there. Uh, here's another shot from the garden, again, showing some of that natural bokeh you get uh, just by getting a little bit closer and focusing in on the closest object. And here's another shot of a bee in the garden here grabbing something out of a tomato plant. But all in, I think, if you are looking to get a nice 4K image quality, you're going to see it on this phone. And I was very pleased with the quality of the video when you've got good light. All right, one last thing to check out before we close out, and that is its gaming and emulation performance. Right now, I am running Genshin Impact on the phone, which is a free-to-play, open-world, Zelda-style game here. And as you can see, the game is running quite nicely on this one. And the performance that you'll get will be the same on this phone as it would be on the more expensive Pixel models because this has the same processor. The difference, though, is that this one has that 60 hertz display versus the 90 hertz on the 6 and the 120 hertz on the 6 Pro. So on those devices, if a game can go beyond 60 frames per second, you will have a smoother gameplay experience than you will on this phone. But I think for most casual gamers, this is going to do just fine, and the game is quite playable. And of course, you can connect Bluetooth controllers up to it or plug controllers in 
to the USB Type-C port for a better gaming experience. All right, let's take a look now at the Dolphin emulator, and we're running a Wave Race on it, and look how nice this runs. We're getting pretty much the full 30 frames per second of this game uh, with great graphics, although it's a little hard to control with the uh, touch display here. And it even works with haptic feedback here, so my uh, phone here is vibrating just like it would on the original system's controller. Again, really hard to control with the touch display here, but the uh, game is running great. And I think a lot of the higher end emulators like the Dreamcast and PlayStation stuff will also run quite nicely on this phone thanks to the Tensor processor inside. And we ran the 3D Mark Wildlife benchmark on the phone. And as you can see here, we came right within the margin of error of what we see on the 6 Pro with the same processor. We got a score of 6,800 on the regular version of Wildlife and the extreme version of that test, we got a score of 1,755. The 6A and the Pro do better than the iPhone SE on the extreme version of the test, but not as well on the regular version of it. But you can see that Apple's A15 processor, which is in both the SE and the 13 Pro, performs better on the Pro version of the phone versus the SE version. So Apple throttles their processors on the lower end devices, whereas Google does not appear to be doing that. So overall, I think the Pixel 6a here packs a good amount of value. It's a nicely performing device. It's got a decent enough camera for the market that they're targeting. It's got a very nice display, excellent performance. There's not much to complain about here. One thing though to look out for are refurbished Pixel 6 phones, which of course have all the features that we pointed out were lacking on this one. And many of those refurbished Pixel 6s can be found for around the same price of the 6a. So you might be able to get yourself into one of those phones if you're on a tight budget and get the benefit of all those features if you don't mind picking up something refurbished. But if you're trying to keep the price down, this is a good value, I think, and continues the lineage of these excellent A-series phones. And this is something that I am very comfortable recommending. That is going to do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.